And, uh, thank you everyone for your patience in this uh, beginning of March uh, inquiry into um, our All My Relations trauma-informed engagement event and also uh, providing an award to an incredible leader in, in this area, uh, Dr. Uh, Corinne Duhamel. Uh, and in order to get started in a good way, I want to uh, pass it over to Shaman Sat, uh, Amanda Nahini, uh, to get us started. Shaman Sat. Good, Ginger. Thank you so much, Ginger. Thank you so much, SFU, for hosting this event. And it's really good to, it feels a, a huge honor to be here for you, Karen, at this time. I really admire the work that you do with the MMIW in Curry. I think it's a very important work. It's very heavy work. Um, I had the opportunity to work as, as a note taker at the MMIW Inquiry Dialogues and um, it changed my life it, for the better. I feel like, um, you know, it, it was um, very informative. Um, I actually wrote a song to it <laughs> from my experience there. It's called Can't Kill Me. It's in honor of MMIW. But uh, it's a new single that's out. And I'd like to start this off in a good way. And um, when, whenever we start anything here in the Coast Salish territory, we like to start off with a prayer. And um, some people say that Coast Salish people have a song for everything. And so we kind of do because, um, you know, we give thanks for everything that we have. And um, the song is a prayer song. The song comes from Sahwalia. Sahwalia lived in Stanley Park in a village called Papayak. And it's a place where we used to gather um, octopus. But she used to live in a longhouse there. And this song is called Greeting of the Day. And it starts off kind of slow, and then it kind of goes a little upbeat because, you know, it, it was she was in mourning, and then she finds her power again, and then she she comes back, you know, in full strength. So the song is a, is um, you know celebrating our abilities to come back from hard times, from terrible times, from traumas, from experiences. And, you know, with the love of community and family, you know, we could really make it through anything. So um, take some time when I, when I sing this song to think of your loved ones, you know, if, for those who are doing good, but also for those who might not be doing good, um, those who might have compromised health and they might have been having to hide out this whole year and um, those in the hospitals, those working in the hospitals, those who are homeless, let's say a prayer for them in our hearts and um, send some good vibes to our families and, you know, really put some um, good energy and, you know, give, give, give some thanks to yourselves, pat yourselves in the back so, you, you know, you're, you're doing a good job. This is greeting of the day.
Poetry go see him. Yeah, one hatch and squalling. Poetry go see him. Yeah, one hatch. Say it's up. It's extremely good, the work that you're doing. Thank you so much for taking the time to acknowledge the traditional territories and the Indigenous peoples. It feels really good in my heart to be here and have a wonderful day. OCM, thank you, Shaman Set. Thank you so much for starting us off in such an incredible and powerful way. And, and to know that you're uh, such so closely connected to uh, Corinne as well. And, and to know that uh, the both of you were able to just support one another uh, in doing your, your work uh, through the Murdered Missing Women Inquiry. Uh, it's, it's an extreme honor to have you here uh, today. Um, so thank you. Thank you for that incredible song and for that uh, blessing for, for our event, for uh, Dr. Corinne Dumel as well. Um, so we are here for the Welsh Community Dialogue. And the Welsh Community Dialogue is uh, an opportunity where we explore community, critical community issues through the art of dialogue. Uh, this is an annual program that engages the community at large with the academic community to explore innovative approaches to local issues through cross-sectional dialogue. And in doing so, would like to acknowledge Bruce and Liz Welsh uh, and all of their uh, critical community support over the years. Uh, and we're really honored to have Liz Welsh joining us today. Uh, just some housekeeping items. Uh, we have three active listeners with us today, Camille Dumond, Michelle Wing, and Monday Zanke. Uh, you can find them in the participant list with a number two right before their name. Um, Camille, I, I see you have listener in front of your, uh, in front of your name. So if you see two or listener, uh, th thank you, Camille. Um, this is in case you need any support uh, during our session today. Um, if you feel that uh, you're triggered, if you feel like uh, you need a break and uh, you want somebody to uh, take to the side to debrief, our three active listeners uh, will uh, bring you to a separate Zoom room uh, and help take care of your needs. Um, we want to make sure that people take care of themselves during this time. And as Shaman Sut uh, reminded us that uh, this is a really uh, stressful time for so many of us. And the act of uh, learning and ensuring that we show up in a good way to support the communities that we're part of um, is done uh, with as much care as possible. And to facilitate this, our three active listeners today are really here for, for all of us. So please, if you feel like you need to take advantage of that, please do. Uh, some of the other items are that we do have closed captioning available today. Uh, you can access the closed captioning function by pressing the CC icon at the bottom of your screen. Um, and to get us started, I would like to introduce Dr. Corinne Dumel. Dr. Dumel is an Anishinaabe Métis woman who was based in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Uh, she is an incredible thought leader who has taught us so much about grounding our academic teachings along with the community-based work that we do. Uh, and through this experience has developed and taught courses on the history of the legacy of residential schools. She's been the director of research for the Jerch Law Corporation, conducting research related to a number of cases related to the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement. Most recently, Dr. Dumel 
was the director of research for the national inquiry into the murdered and missing indigenous women and girls. Uh, she drafted the final report as well as managed the forensic document review project and the legacy archive. Such important work that helps daylight the role of cultural and colonial uh, impacts uh, in our lives uh, in Indigenous communities today and is bringing all of her work forward uh, with one of her current projects, which is working on the Murdered and Missing Women Indigenous Girls National Action Plan and ensuring that it is implemented. And there is so much more that I can say about this incredible individual, but I really want to pass it over to her to talk about why she is here uh, with us today. Uh, Dr. Corinne Durmel is going to be uh, this year's recipient of the Bruce and Liz Welsh Award. We are incredibly honored to have her here with us uh, and to recognize uh, just her important contributions now in the past and into the future. So uh, we're extremely uh, proud to present you with this award and I will pass it over to you to uh, walk us through some of the teachings and learnings uh, that we're here uh, to experience today. Corinne. So, uh, hi everybody, Chimigwetch here, uh, coming to you today from Winnipeg, Treaty One territory in the homeland of the Métis Nation. I'm, it's me who's humbled to be here actually, and I just want to start by thanking Amanda uh, with all my heart for the song. I have very fond memories of, of the guided dialogues and of hearing you sing there, and it really sort of brought me back. It lifted my spirits to hear you sing again, so uh, thank you so much for for, for doing that and 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 many thanks to uh, to uh, SFU to the Welsh uh, award um, and to all of you for joining us here today I have to admit that when I was first approached about this I wasn't really sure what I would have to offer uh, and it's because I've sort of learned what I'm doing by doing the work. And, and in that process, I've had to start over. I've had to take some steps back. And so I'm really just excited to be here and to share some thoughts with you today about the work that I've been doing um, not just me, but as part of, I think, a bigger movement around trying to reclaim power and place, um, around walking with and alongside uh, communities and families and women um, to share stories, but also to share um, how these stories can contribute to very different solutions. There's a very Western lens that, off, that is often put on trauma and trauma-informed practices. And so today, just as a way to sort of frame our conversation, I'd like to offer maybe a few thoughts on how I've come to where I am, um, prefaced by the fact that I still very much consider myself to be a learner and Probably if we have a talk again like this in 10 years, I'll have some more things to share that are different than what I'm sharing today. But uh, Chimigwech for having me here. And um, with that, can you move the slide forward one, please? So uh, my experience in trauma-informed engagement or practice is in part shaped by my own personal experience. Uh, my granny, who's uh, that incredible lady pictured on this slide with me uh, as about a six-year-old, I think, was a very tough lady. Uh, she was the daughter of a residential school survivor whose family spent a great deal of time and effort trying not to be Indigenous. Uh, granny uh, lived in Thunder Bay, and she told people that she was from Spain because it was really dangerous to be an Indigenous person in Thunder Bay. When I was little, she used to pet my blonde, light brown hair uh, and say how lucky I was to have such light blonde hair. She knew all too well the racism that she and, and my aunties, her own children, and my mom had faced. Uh, my auntie was called throughout uh, her, her childhood a dirty little Indian at school, among other things. And so I think my granny hoped that that wouldn't happen to her grandchildren. 
her behavior in her life, but more than that, her interactions with me were very much shaped by those experiences. <clears throat> My dad, who is that handsome man on the slide, uh, was my hero and also a real inspiration for doing this kind of work. He was absolutely the best person. He was uh, so full of joy, so full of life, and he had lived a really storied life, but also a really tough life. And he carried a lot of that forward in some of his actions, in his often extreme impatience, um, in his extreme pride in his tendency to protect people to the extreme sometimes. Uh, he got cancer when I was 17 or 18, but he never told me. In fact, I only found out that he'd been ill two years later after the cancer returned even more aggressively. And only after he'd seen that I'd started my first degree at a university across the country. Over the next year and from a distance, I saw a person that was so confident so sure, become very fragile, angry, and resentful. He felt, I think, um, betrayed by life, right? Uh, to be ambitious as he was and, and to know that your clock was running out um, was, I think, for him the ultimate betrayal. And during that time, it became really difficult to speak to him. I felt like I didn't really know him anymore. And I think because of sort of the trauma and the realization that he had been through and that he was going through, it really changed the dynamic of our interactions. He passed away when I was 20. Um, and it was, you know, in a context where I didn't really, I hadn't done any of this work, I didn't know about it. And I sort of often wish that we could speak again, because I feel like I could do that better. <laughs> But I share these uh, stories as a way of leading into a teaching that I recently heard as part of my work for the National Action Plan from an elder, uh, Myra Laramie, somebody that we worked with during the National Inquiry and that I work with now, uh, who's a really beautiful person that always has, you know, these incredible words of wisdom that sort of pop into the conversation, uh, sometimes when you don't expect them. Um, She's been working with us on the National Action Plan and a few weeks ago while we were waiting for our meeting to start she was talking about COVID-19 and the hardship that people are having. And she talked about how her dad once told her that we are not human beings, we are just humans being. And I think that's actually really profound. And I think that when we reconceptualize this notion of individual human beings, and we think about humans being together, then we open up our minds to receiving input from those with whom we are talking and from their experiences. In the case of my granny and my dad, recognizing them as humans being allowed me, albeit a little bit too late, to come to an understanding and a place of healing related to these perspectives and to my experiences with them, to see them as humans trying to be and as humans in relationship with the world and the circumstances around them. Next slide, please. So I think that, you know, what is true today, and especially I think probably um, amplified in the context of COVID, is a real atomization of the world. For me, even in my lifetime, I've seen the world that I live become even more and more individualized or atomized. We are often together, but alone. And I think that as we've grown into an atomized world, something has changed within us. And creating a system for individuals and not for the community, I think that we've fundamentally changed people's capacity to live a non-atomized life, to form healthy bonds and to maintain them. And by extension, then to engage with other people in what we might consider to be a trauma-informed way. For me, what this means for engagement is that I think often we don't really listen anymore. Not really. We don't connect. Not really. But deep listening, deep connection, deep relationship. I think that these are things that we have to do to engage in a trauma informed way. Next slide, please. So one of my favorite quotes and one I think that really represents my experience is from Maya Angelou says, do the best you can until you know better than when you know better, do better. Uh, there's lots of times that I've done this work that I didn't know better and that I did the best that I could. Um, and as a result of making mistakes, uh, I think I've become better at it. 
Um, but while I've learned some lessons about trauma-informed engagement in my personal life, these lessons, the ones that are most important, come from doing the work with family members, survivors, elders, and knowledge keepers, uh, comes from working on issues that touch communities and families the most deeply. The experience of sitting with people actually sitting with them, hearing their experiences, hearing about what's happened uh, to them, to their ancestors, that's been really life-changing. Amanda said at the beginning that her experiences in the guided dialogues were life-changing, and so have mine been as well, so I connect with you on that, Amanda. Uh, and it's changed everything I do, and I think it's changed what I do for the better. Um, I know that thanks to these teachers, I now know better and I still have so much to learn, but I'm working on it. And I think that brings me to the other ingredient that I think is really necessary for trauma-informed engagement, um, and it's humility. Um, we have to be willing to throw what we think we know uh, out the door. Uh, the ability to accept how much you don't know, I think, is a really important component for trauma-informed engagement. Um, and accepting that no matter how much we study, how much we read, we can't learn how to do without actually doing. And we can't learn without recognizing what we don't know. Next slide, please. I think for me, ultimately, uh, trauma-informed engagement is relationship making and everything that goes with that. Uh, in many Indigenous languages, there's a, a phrase, all my relations. I'm not a fluent speaker, and so I rely heavily on fluent speakers to teach me the intricacies of these things. Uh, but all my relations is often used in prayer. And my favorite explanation of this idea comes from Richard Wagamese, who says, all my relations means not just those people who look like you, talk like you, act like you, sing, dance, celebrate, worship, or pray like you. It means everyone. It can also mean everything that relies on air, water, sunlight, and the power of the earth and the universe itself for sustenance and perpetuation. It's a recognition of the fact that we're all one body moving through time and space together. To say these words is to offer a doorway to that understanding to those who hear you. It's to proclaim in one sentence that this experience of living is a process of coming together and that it was always meant to be. And so when I think of all my relations, I think of the opposite of atomization. I think about living together. I think about doing things in relationship and with a realization that we're all connected. And so when I think about trauma-informed engagement, I think about all my relations, uh, everyone, everything, as opening a new doorway to understanding, uh, as coming together, and, and as looking into and trying to understand what connects us all. Next slide, please. So um, as been noted, um, I worked with the National Inquiry with Families and Survivors, and I'm now working on the National Action Plan. And our mandate was very broad. It was to look into and report on the systemic causes of all forms of violence against Indigenous women and girls, including sexual violence. And we're also asked to examine all of the underlying causes, um, including the historical, cultural, economic, institutional. And so within that very, very large mandate, it became really important to look at commissions and inquiries in general, but also how we know what we know, what we consider to be valid knowledge or good knowledge or truth. And it leads me to this question, especially as it relates to engaging about whose knowledge is privileged and who has the power to define the problem or the question. Traditionally, uh, that has been uh, for us non-Indigenous people. We are studied to death. Um, often state projects like inquiries or commissions are framed within the context of saviorism. And for me, this is very disenfranchising and it's also disempowering. Um, and it's misleading. I think learning from the real experts is an important part of trauma-informed practice, but it requires reinterpreting who we mean uh, by experts and what we mean by trauma. 
um, how we frame trauma is often really individualized. It's seen as something that occurred to a person. But if we consider things like intergenerational trauma or systemic trauma, we can expand our frame and that has important implications for the solutions that emerge. Um, we often talk about trauma um, in, in the lens of sort of Western ways of knowing as a deficit um, based framework. Um, but in the most of the context that I've worked, Indigenous people have unique knowledge about the colonial system as it exists today and how it contributes to their experiences of trauma. That experiential knowledge, experiential, sorry, knowledge of Indigenous people rooted in individual and collective trauma allow for understandings of the systems, of policies um, and of the conceptualization of problems and causes in a way that can't be known by people who haven't experienced it. And so family members, grandmothers, community leaders, everyone who walked with us on the national inquiry uh, impacted our output. We, we changed what we were doing and how we were doing it because of it. We, we had to have the courage to throw out what we thought that we should produce from a technical perspective and really be led by the real experts, the people with experience. And this particular insight really dramatically changed what the National Inquiry rep recommended um, and also how we did our work. And so I'm really grateful for this experience and also for all the gifts that that folks shared with us during the process um, and how much it's changed about my work uh, even outside the process today. Next slide, please. So I think there are implications for practice and we'll get into those a little bit more probably in our chats, but I would like to sort of extend this notion of thinking about how we understand trauma. For example, a really problematic interpretation of trauma uh, is that the knowledge of Indigenous peoples is centrally rooted in trauma. Uh, trauma discourse has become really part of this mainstream narrative about how people need to be helped or saved. This is true globally, it's also true locally. Um, but um, the dominant discourses around trauma continue to define violence within a sort of a colonial framework. In other words, relegating trauma to individualized experiences and focusing only on the experiences of individuals rather than what these experiences tell us about society often erases the naming of certain kinds of violence like racism, structural violence, or violence to indigenous lands and bodies. I think it's important to note that trauma theory comes out of a particular place and time and history of ideas. And it's been since it sort of emerged a raced and classed and gendered theory. And it serves a purpose. For example, framing trauma as an individual experience allows for state funded and controlled research and media coverage that often exploits statistics of horror and shock to justify interven intervention and to uphold this notion that the West knows best or so we're told. But challenging this eraser is what Indigenous communities have always done. It's the heart of the work that I'm trying to do. Intergenerational and multi-generational trauma speaks to the fact that we've remembered our own histories, our songs, our ceremonies, our languages. We have remembered who we are. And so challenging and healing from trauma and engaging in trauma-informed practice is rooted in our existence since time immemorial on the land in an understanding of Indigenous ways of knowing and understanding the world and into our own insights about healing and how we might approach transforming society through relationship building and respect. I really think that if we look at it this way, trauma-informed practice, if we really understand it, can generate new pathways. Um, so next slide, please. And this is my last slide. <laughs> so ultimately, I think we are, need to be willing to be led by 
the real experts. We need to go down new roads. We can't continue to engage with people who are targeted, marginalized with this complex that we're somehow saving people by bringing in sort of this outside or, or Western-based perspective on individual trauma. It's not non-Indigenous society's role to save us, but it is everyone's role to be a change maker. So I think whether you work in trauma-informed practice with Indigenous communities or not, I encourage everyone to look at this work through a new lens, one that holds space rather than making space, holds space for developing the kind of practice that leads us to new roads, to new understandings, and that really changes the world. Um, in the National Inquiry's final report, we talk about empowering new kinds of encounters based on the fact that most of the people who shared their stories with us told a story about all these different points of contact, historical and in their own, own lifetimes, with institutions or ideas or people that ultimately led them, <clears throat> pardon me, or their loved ones towards harm. I think that we can all participate in this notion of change making of empowering healing encounters instead of harming ones through every aspect of our practice in whatever area that we work. So being a change maker in these spaces means changing the focus of what we think trauma can teach us, not for our own benefit, but for the benefit of others. I think it means recognizing the agency, the resiliency, the power, the knowledge of Indigenous communities and people, but more generally of people with experience. In addition, I think as those from communities who are still dealing with trauma, what we can do as Indigenous people is work to reclaim power and place to remember who we are. Uh, and that's what we can do. I think that what uh, to sort of close my introduction, I just like to share one more teaching. This one was I'm working on a project with uh, treaty elders from treaty one territory and we're talking about the spirit and intent of treaty one. And recently, uh, one of the elders said to me uh, that it was important to look around in nature for all of the lessons that it would teach me. And I wasn't really sure what I was looking for. Um, but uh, we sort of talked about it some more and the elder pointed out that if you look in nature, everything is made in a circle. Planets are spheres, uh, trees, uh, tree trunks are in a circle, birds nests are in a circle. And if you look in nature, you'll find circles virtually everywhere that you look. The reason that the circle is important is because it's the strongest sheep. And when everybody gets together in a circle, the chain of knowledge and the strength of that space uh, is undeniable. And so I'm really grateful to be here today. And I'm grateful that we're all in this circle, virtual uh, as it may be, uh, where we can really think about how collectively um, the strength and the knowledge in this circle is unending and how we can all go into thinking about trauma and hopefully by extension trauma-informed practice uh, in a very, very different way. So chimi guach, and I'll leave it at that for now. Uh, thanks, Corinne. Um, we are going to have a little conversation just to unpack everything that you just talked about because we're in this new, this new place in our society where, as you mentioned, we're breaking down a lot of those colonial identifiers that painted Indigenous peoples as either victims or um, as, as peoples who were so disempowered they needed to be saved. And as, as a young woman, uh, when I was uh, uh, a youth advocate, one of my earliest uh, uh, understandings of First Nations and Métis and Inuit communities across this country was, wow, like we're all struggling 
with the same symptoms of post-traumatic stress stemming from the residential schools. And it blew my mind that our communities could be so separate by geography and yet be experiencing such similar symptoms of disempowerment. And when I think about um, why we are the way that we are, you know, it stems back to, you know, your original family teachings, how, you know, the impacts just weren't talked about, how there was such a, a history of either shame or silence and not talking about the things that we're experiencing. And that when we're doing work with Indigenous communities, you have to bring that understanding with you. Otherwise, you're just not going to be impactful. And then we're in this, we're in this circle, we're in this loop of either reinforcing the status quo or looking at another circle over there where we're actually empowered and self-determining. And so the question I have for you is when we bring trauma-informed practice into our thinking, into our work, into how we frame our projects and how we frame our solutions, how does trauma-informed practices change the work in the process? bringing us from, you know, maybe an uninformed status quo to something different, you know, it's the path of evolution. So how does it change the outcome? Yeah, so I think like, you know, when you start from a different place, then you end at a different place. And that's really what we found in the inquiry. You know, I came into this context with a really keen understanding of what reports are supposed to look like. And I'm deliberately using air quotes from that. Um, But what we really quickly realized is that we were going to have the first ever real experts report because we were really going to go off of what family members and survivors were telling us about these experiences. And I think when you reconceptualize trauma from an individual to a broader concept um, and, and you accept the fact that those with the experience, with this experiential knowledge, uh, have the most to say about how we should get to the next stage or the next part or how we should engage in healing, Um, then what you open the door to is really dramatically different solutions. I think solutions that embrace agency, that are empowering, that raise up self-determined practices. You know, one of the things that really stuck with me and I think it came out in some of the research processes like the guided dialogues that we sort of created um, was the fact that there were so many people doing good work in communities that were you know had started with this amazing idea about how to help people in really specific and and relevant terms and they were constantly being sort of thwarted by a system that tried to impose like one size fits all solutions or that were unwilling to look beyond this lens of individual trauma to engage a much broader notion of community healing. If you just look at it at a smaller level, for example, if you look in a family, and this is not even specific to Indigenous people, any family that you can think of, when one member of that family has had a traumatic experience, they're not the only people dealing with trauma. The whole family is dealing with trauma. And then by extension, so if we're thinking about you know, engaging with people to try to find solutions or build policies or programs, we really have to think about looking at those things in a wider lens so that trauma-informed engagement doesn't become about asking a very specific and limited question. It becomes about questioning the system that these things are based on. So, you know, for us, that really changed the solutions and you know, one of the root causes that we found that that perpetuates and, and upholds violence against Indigenous people, and in particular Indigenous women, is a denial of the agency and expertise of Indigenous women and girls and communities, right? And so when you accept the fact that the people that know the most about this are the people with experience, 
then you also, by extension, must accept the fact that that's where the solutions will come from. <laughs> I missed a word there. Uh, but there's so much resistance to recognizing that knowledge, right? And, and we see it, you know, we're, you know, in this era of talking about systemic racism, you know, it really, you know, has its roots in the more recent Black Lives Matter mo movement. And it's giving us this new language that uh, people like yourself have been talking about and integrating into their work for years. And so, you know, you are someone, uh, and, and this is from our earlier conversations, who has really learned by doing, really learned by listening and acknowledging um, what other people have not been able to either understand or accept or value or listen to. And that, that was the normal, that, that, that was our normal, you know, always being on the outside, um, having a set of solutions that didn't necessarily make sense to those who are in decision-making positions. And so, you know, when you started off uh, your, your presentation on your learning journey, you talked about how we are right now, not just in COVID, but, you know, that image of everybody looking at their phones and being disconnected and how we're moving more towards being disconnected than being together and it's going to make it harder to come together over time. And so our understanding of normal is changing anyways, but there still seems to be a lot of risk associated with bringing you know, new lenses, new knowledge, new values into the solution building equation. And you talked earlier, not in your presentation, but in our earlier discussions, about how a lot of uh, people feel like they're throwing their good work out the window, you know, and the path in front of them is unclear and people feel paralyzed from starting because they don't understand a trauma-informed approach and what it really is. Um, so can you talk a little bit about how change is normal and what the evolution of this actually can look like, and maybe some of the barriers that are in the way for uh, folks that might feel paralyzed from, uh, from starting and throwing what they're used to out the window. Yeah, so I, I've always been really uh, comfortable with being uncomfortable. I like I, I very much in my life just generally both personally and professionally embrace this notion of sort of starting over or starting anew or reinventing or, or doing things in an unconventional way. But as I'm realizing and I never really thought about it until I actually started looking for jobs in my field where everyone was like wow you have a really weird cv and it doesn't really read like an academic cv and it doesn't really really read like a an executive cv and we're not really sure what to do with this right and so for me it, like it, it was a bit demoralizing because I think you know I think that what I've done has value uh, but like I also understand that it doesn't fit into a certain a sort a sort of niche um, I think that you know when we understand trauma-informed practice or engagement um, not as a process but or not as a checklist, but as a process and, and a relationship, right? Then the extension of that idea is that it's very dynamic. There's not one relationship that you'll ever engage in, whether it's personally or more broadly, that's not going to change over time. <laughs> All of these things change over time. And I think for, for us, like embracing, <clears throat> for me, em embracing uncertainty is part of the process of being open and willing to acknowledge that you don't know what you don't know, right? And being able and willing to, you know, embrace change and, and movement. For, 
I think, you know, one of the things that happen um, in the inquiry in terms of, of thinking about this notion of barriers um, is that we really had to <clears throat> be comfortable with getting to the point that we could get to being led by family members and survivors. And so I didn't know whether that was going to be like a a short report, a, a long report, a, a video, a, a website, like I just wasn't sure what the output was. But the most important part of that was the relationship. And so if we had the right relationships, if we had the right engagement practices, then the output would emerge. And I think that's the thing. It's like being willing to be led by and driven to an output that reflects what people say is actually really, really important important. And I think that while a lot of people look at this sort of thing as like really risky, and I think that's, in a sense, that's some of the re reluctance that I've um, found and like things like job searches where people are like, Ooh, we're not sure what, what you're going to do. We're not sure what to make of you. Um, is that like, ultimately, it is risk mitigation. When you can walk alongside community, when you can walk alongside family members, when you can walk alongside the people that are contributing to your project or to your policy or to your framework, when you're doing that in partnership, then you don't need to be the loudest person in the room that's defending it at the end because you're walking with all of these people beside you and around you, you're not walking alone. So in fact, when people, like, and I've worked in museums and law, like all these places where like people are really risk averse, like professionally, really risk averse people, um, where I've said like your best risk, you know, if you wanna put it in those terms, your best risk mitigation is in fact doing this in a trauma informed way through partnership because those are the folks that will defend and speak for you in the end. What they said will be reflected in what you do and ultimately that's what guarantees the success of whatever it is you're doing. Yeah, it makes so much sense. And I feel like just from the uh, questions and comments in the chat that a lot of what you're saying is resonating with people's experiences. And I think, you know, if we ask people to put their hands up to say like, who has felt like that person in the room that was never understood and was probably asking to do things in a different way as opposed to uh, showing up and delivering a prescriptive program uh, that hasn't worked, um, how would that make you feel uh, on the other end? And we have, a lot of people with us today. Uh, we have almost 360 people uh, with us right now. And uh, we wanna ensure that uh, folks could uh, connect with you. There's a lot of questions for you right now. And so uh, we have a number of facilitators lined up and we're gonna spend uh, 15 minutes in a breakout room. And Corinne, you're also going to be part of the breakout groups as well. Uh, we're going to take 15 minutes to go into breakout groups as a means for you to debrief, you being all of our participants today, witnesses to Corinne's uh, experiences and, and learning journey. This is going to be your opportunity to reflect on what you've heard uh, reflect with one another and uh, generate some questions for Corinne. Uh, we want to ensure that um, each of you also has a chance to reflect on other people's questions. So we have the Slido uh, 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 app. <laughs> we have Slido set up for everybody. Uh, so you can uh, upload your questions for Corinne at slido.com using the event code uh, hashtag 40604 um, and uh, vote on other people's questions as well as upload yourselves. But um, we're gonna uh, send everybody into breakout groups right now. 
for those of you who have had your cameras and microphones off, now is a good time uh, to uh, turn everything on. Um, and uh, for those of you who have difficulty uploading to Slido, you can add your questions in the chat and our tech folks will upload them into Slido for you. So um, facilitators, uh, Corinne, uh, we're going to send you off for 15 minutes. We'll be back at 11.10. 11.10. We'll see you back here in 15 minutes. People are starting to come back. How do we look for people? Good. Thank you, Elodie. Hi, welcome back everyone. I hope that you had a good session in your breakout groups. Thank you to all the facilitators uh, who uh, helped walk everyone through this, this process. Uh, we have a number of questions in the Slido and Corinne has been here for the last few minutes just pulling her thoughts together for uh, some pretty good responses um, we, we have uh, 20 minutes now for questions, um, and I just want to get right into it. Uh, Corinne, we're going to start with the top questions in the Slido. Uh, we have 26 questions overall. Really encourage people to go and vote uh, for, for the questions that they want uh, you, Corinne, to answer. Um, the first question is, how do trauma-informed practices manifest differently depending on the audience you're working with and the type of trauma they have experienced? <clears throat> oh man, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm losing my voice today. Um, I, I mostly spend the day talking to my dog and she's not very demanding, so it's... <laughs> um, anyways, thank you for the question. I think that's really important. <clears throat> and I'd like to sort of preface my answer by saying that I, I've, I've primarily done my work with Indigenous communities, but with Indigenous people coming from very different sort of perspectives. So I started out in this work, uh, working with residential school survivors um, who were making claims under the Indian Residential School Settlement Agreement for under the indig individual assessment process. And as part of that process, um, people were required to fill in a questionnaire <clears throat> that essentially detailed the details of their experiences at residential schools. In addition to that, they were asked to rank the, the damage done by those experiences on a numerical scale. So uh, I've come from that to working, you know, with um, communities in the um, practice of collecting oral histories about uh, things like relocations, things like identity, um, and then now most recently um, within the context of MMIWG. So 
sharing our trauma, uh, sorry, the question around um, how the practices sort of differ from one environment to the next um, is really interesting because through all of those experiences, there's been certain principles that I've taken forward that are sort of more broad or really useful. And so I think the first sort of principle is to think about, you know, learning about the people that you're working with uh, and the sort of unique context from which these experiences emerge. Uh, there's going to be different kinds of experiences, um, different types of people, um, and, and all of that is really important, but it's important to really find the unifying thread. So, for example, when, when we were doing our work at the National Inquiry, uh, the unifying thread was that this idea that our women and girls are sacred. And so all of our trauma-informed engagement was really framed by that idea that our women and girls are sacred. And when we took that core, when we took that as the heart of what we were doing, then it might mean that in a particular setting, we were engaging different practices. But all of those practices were oriented toward the purpose of raising up this idea that our women and girls are sacred. And what does that look like? So I think that it's important to acknowledge that not everybody that you're working with will be coming from the exact same experiences. But within what you're doing, there's an opportunity, I think, to sit with people and to try to generate some principles that can hold up all the practices that you engage. Um, and so, um, you know, this notion, for example, of our women and girls are sacred is a core principle and it can manifest in how you're talking to people, what protocols you're using, how you're collecting information, how you're sharing that information. And I'm speaking now from a research perspective. Um, if you're looking at through, through more of a policy lens, it can manifest in the way that you evaluate policy, who is at the table, how you're incorporating that knowledge into um, the revision that you're doing. So I think that, you know, what I really am attracted to in this work is this notion of coming up with principles. And in a sense, this is informed by lots of my other work. One of the things that I do is I work with the Treaty Relations Commission of Manitoba, and we talk about principles for treaties, right? And we talk about the importance of seeing beyond the fine print of these agreements to really capture the original spirit and intent, the original principles that animated these agreements. And so in the same way, I think that trauma-informed engagement can be driven by important principles, but they're always principles that have to be co-developed with communities and begin with uh, learning from community about what matters and what's important. Uh, there, there's a lot of feedback, Corinne, in the comments about these principles and um, how they're resonating with, with everybody in, in uh, the path to doing our work differently. And uh, we see a, a trend in a lot of these questions, and it's really about reframing the work differently, being brave enough to voice that things need to be done differently. And uh, the next question uh, looks like it's about uh, the individual in an organization uh, being brave, being that person who puts their hand up to say that uh, we need to recognize the communities that we work with differently. Um, but the process of doing that is a little unclear. And so the question is, how do we share our trauma, our uh, individual trauma uh, in a work setting enough to have some flexibility with our workload, but to also prevent labeling from other colleagues as being uh, unable to work with or coming across as weak? Um, this question resonates for, for me, as, as I'm, I'm sure it does for you as well. And I imagine that this is a predominantly non-Indigenous workspace that we're talking about too. Do you have some thoughts to share on that? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And it's one that, uh, you know, I, 
I'm still trying to answer myself, <laughs> as you noted, Ginger. So, you know, I can share some thoughts about where I'm coming from on this, but I'm not sure that I have, you know, the, the answer of all answers for that one, um, which is to say that I really think that it's important that where, wherever people work and, and everybody that's here can participate in this part, which is to reframe and, and uphold the value of experiential knowledge um, and, and the importance of it. But as that sort of translates to to the sharing of trauma in the workplace um, and, and, and the specificities of your question. You know, in the national inquiry, we had most of our staff were family members or survivors, right? This is just the reality in which we were working. And so, um, you know, this didn't mean that we went around and said, you know, oh, you know, uh, or, or it didn't mean that we characterized people as weak, we characterized them as knowledgeable right but you can't characterize yourself as knowledgeable it's like that sort of has to come also from a validation of that kind of knowledge in the workplace so you know I think that part of that is that we need to revalue that we need to raise up this notion um, that folks that have some experience um, with trauma uh, are folks that uh, have a lot of knowledge but because of that um, you know, dealing with trauma and the work of healing is a very long journey. And I would like to see more support in workplaces for people to do that kind of work. Um, I know at the NI, one of the things that we really tried to do was essentially to build in a lot of flex for people. If people wanted to go to ceremony, if they needed to take some time to just do what they needed to do right that was one of the things within our workplace culture that we really embraced um, and we really embraced those folks as people that had a lot of value and a lot to share with us that was important so for for us in the ni um you know it was never a label of of weak or unable but i've worked in other places where um, it's not been such an open setting and I've not really been able to share those things because of the sort of baggage that comes with, I think, the way that we understand trauma, like that society at large understands trauma. And so, you know, I, I don't know that that really answers your question, except to say that I think that your question really speaks to the heart of the work that we have to do, which is to be kind, to be in relationship with people, um, to be open to different ways of doing things and different ways of working, um, and to acknowledge the place and the importance of healing, um, but also to value this experience and this knowledge. And somebody said in the chat, practicing lateral kindness. Uh, I think that's a really great way to sort of sum up uh, what I'm trying to get at in not so direct or clear of a way, you know, lateral kindness. Yeah. Uh, there seems to be a lot of connection with the notion of a safe space. And, you know, what you're talking about is an emerging area for organizations, bringing Indigenous people, bringing Black people of colour into organizations, and that duty of care that organizations have for their staff, but people not necessarily finding that these spaces are necessarily safe. Um, and so, um, you know, there's, there's a lot that, that probably can be dug into in, in respect of uh, when a space is not safe. And this is a, a question right in the comments that I, I'm raising because it really flows into the last question that you asked. So when a space is not safe, how does one address that and keep those involved safe? And how does one hold this responsibility to ensure safety? Sorry, Ginger, was that a question for me or a general? Yeah, sort of? yeah, yeah, it is for you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you're you're you pondering just, and, that, and that's fine. I was fine. pondering. Yes, I'm sorry. I was pondering uh, and, and I'm not sure that I have a, a ready answer to it. That, that's fine. Um, we can talk about 
uh, safe spaces and unsafe spaces and, and the type of advice and, and direction you have for, for folks who find themselves in that position, uh, you know, towards the end of our conversation here. Sure. So we'll just put that in, a, in the parking lot for now. Uh, but I just wanted to flag that it was getting a lot of traction in the comment section. Thanks. Yeah. Um, the, the other question that is getting a lot of traction is, um, people want you to unpack a little further the difference between holding space versus making space Mm -hmm. because, you know, the, the, the title of our event today is, uh, trauma informed for, uh, engagement, you know, focusing on Indigenous communities. And there is a big difference in holding space versus making space. And so I think that people are kind of wanting to know Mm -hmm. um, uh, the the making space. What what does that look like? And holding space for uh, for people's personal safety, but also the safety of the participants they're working with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think like, so I've come to a realization around the difference of making space and holding space by working with with the folks at the National Inquiry, actually. Uh, I I had always used the the idea of making space until I started learning a little bit more about it. And I started talking about holding space, because I think that when you say that you're making space for somebody, it, it sort of imposes this notion that you have a right to make space for people. It's an unequal sort of relationship where you say, oh, you know, poor you, I'm going to make this space for you. Come on in, right? Um, But when you hold space, I think that it means that you take the time that it needs to take to get that perspective or get that information. Holding space means for me that people have a right to be there, that that is their space and that you're just holding it until they come. Um, I think making space too sort of implies like a tag attacking on of something for me Um, whereas holding space for me really implies like an embedded sort of partnership and a co-creation and a building so that's how I sort of differentiate making space and holding space where holding space for me really speaks to sort of the inherent right of people to participate in conversations uh, where the outcomes dramatically impact them in conversations that are about them Um, and so we shouldn't as organizations or you know this plays out in different ways depending on where you are and where you work but um, the notion of making space uh, assumes that you have a right to make it Uh, holding space assumes that people have a right to be there and and I think that that's why I tend towards the latter you know holding space empowers people Um, as somebody in the chat has pointed out thanks Shelly for that Um, you know uh, I don't find making space as, as empowering for people um, so much as demonstrating the power of the person making the space. Yeah, and, and there's a, a comment on uh, the colonial idea of time limitation or extraction when you're doing your community engagement. And so, you know, it really ties nicely into this next question around um, using trauma-informed practice uh, in the community engagement process and exploring some of the concepts around the creation and the design of activities. And also, you know, that the, the understanding that uh, when we're working in communities, it's not just to extract, yeah. you know, it is to empower and it's to help strengthen these concepts and aspirations for self-determination, cultural reconnection, and that what we're doing or what we should be doing is moving towards community empowerment mm-hmm. you know, in, in the engagement but it's not necessarily always the case is it no it's not and I think we often you know when we when we it's been my experience and certainly I can speak about my experience more recently in creating the national action plan um, you know that I was approached in a particular way which I didn't love Um, to join a process that I was not comfortable with. And I think after the very first meeting, I I phoned 
<laughs> the person in charge. And I think I talked to them for about an hour about all the things that I found sort of objectionable or offensive <laughs> about this process as it had been presented to me so far. Uh, and luckily, you know, there was some openness to the idea of like completely changing course and of doing this differently. Um, but so often we approach um, engagement as an item to check off of our list. Like, oh, one of the phases of our project is community engagement. Um, and this is like a to-do. And once we've talked to some folks, we can sort of check that off. For me, you know, when we reconceptualize community engagement and trauma-informed practice by extension as a process of relationship, um, then it becomes a like a, a process that as somebody pointed out in the chat, chat, it will take as long as it takes. You know, there's a lot of mistrust uh, and very understandable mistrust in the world around engaging with institutions like research institutions, like policymakers, right? Um, people are carrying in lots of cases, a lot of mistrust. In French, we say méfiance. Um, wariness uh no we are I, I don't know the word in english i'm sorry <laughs> mifiance for people that speak french but anyways uh into these processes and with really good reason and so you know as it sort of implies for you know how to develop programs and activities again i think those need to be guided both in like scope and in content and in time by the folks that you're working with and um for me it's really you know trauma-informed engagement and, and sort of community engagement should be about a relationship. Uh, it should be about um, co-creating something, right? The thing that emerges at the end should be something that's co-created. And then the extension of that is that it gets evaluated in partnership. It gets revised in partnership. It's not just a checklist item. And I think we have to move beyond this notion of engagement as like a thing to check off of our list, which is so often the case um, in how it gets rolled out. I, yes, absolutely. Um, I, I, I find myself incredibly frustrated with uh, where we're moving towards right now with uh, community engagement being a necess necessary action item for any government policy or process, regardless of its relevance for empowering or supporting the aspirations of Indigenous communities. Um, and, you know, moving this feels like uh, moving a rock uphill or, uh, <laughs> you know, being the only one in the room that understands the benefits of designing uh, not just a healing, but a useful tool of uh, community voice, uh, community connection, rebuilding community connections. You know, at the beginning of your presentation, you know, you give your own examples of where your family line has been broken. And that is what we're experiencing right now. And COVID is just reinforcing this and everyone and so coming out of this experience, we're all going to be experiencing what it's like to rebuild those connections as we're managing our workloads. Um, and I, I, I think that, you know, the language that you're bringing forward for this type of work is incredibly timely. Um, yeah, we, we have a comment in here about how this is the trend. As we're, as we're moving towards community engagement as the trend, we're reinforcing perhaps that narrative of Indigenous peoples needing to be saved or yeah. Indigenous peoples have problems. And yeah. how do you reframe that? I love the, 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 the statement in the chat about we must ask ourselves why we are doing something. I think we should always be doing something because it, we want it to work. And if we want it like, you know, and if, so if we want it to work, then we have to think about how we're doing it. I actually think that, you know, sometimes when we start with the, the question of like, oh, have we done community engagement instead of why are we doing community engagement? Uh, we limit the scope of what we can find. We actually limit the scope of the solutions. And it speaks to this notion, as Amanda's pointed out, about intention, right, or being performative. And so like, why are we doing something? 
Well, because we hope that it's going to work. And how is it going to work? It's going to work uh, if it has impact, if it's informed by the folks that it's trying to serve, if the folks that are trying are going to be served by it are involved in it and are involved in doing the work, or sorry, uh, are involved in engagement, but also in evaluating the quality of that later on, right? So I think that's a really, really important um, um, point that, that folks have raised in the chat as well. Thank you very much for that. Uh, do you have examples where uh, you've seen the intention around building relationships, mm -hmm. building yeah. fun, building healing practices, building, you know, connection to the land? brought in mm -hmm. yeah so one of the things that was really interesting um when i entered the national inquiry which was a bit late in the game i must say like i joined in may of 2018 and i noticed right away that there were communities uh, and sort of relationships that that we didn't have uh that were like giant uh, elephants in our room where I didn't feel like we could sort of um, legitimately uh, talk about any of these issues without having sat down um, with um, not just um, survivors and family members, um, but also with people who were providing services or doing the work. And so what we designed actually, and in partnership with the SFU Center or the, the Morris J. Wasp Center for Dialogue. So um, that was such a great process was the series of guided dialogues and guided dialogues were really designed to bring together essentially in a very open question format to say we think it's really important for family members and survivors and for communities to have relationships with frontline service providers and people that work in the community and so the uh in interesting sort of thing about that was to bring together people in conversation and to see where those conversations led within the context of a facilitated dialogue. So we had four of those and what was really also very cool about it is that our dialogue sort of centered on bringing people together and as part of bringing people together, you know, that was the goal that we started with. What do we want to do? We want to bring these conversations together. We want for people to be in relationship, in conversation. How do we support that? Well, we supported bringing people together, but we also supported things like within the context of the guided dialogues, having um, beating tables there for people to be able to engage together on a different level, right? So we would have this table that you could go visit if you were feeling triggered or you're having a hard time and you could sit down and, and go through a beating exercise with a, a beater who would help you. And you could sit with people and just talk or have tea or have a dessert, right? And you were building relationships. And one of the things that was so cool for me coming out of that very first guided dialogue that we did around 2SLGBTQQIA people was that we had so many youth and there were so many youth that were part of the dialogue who came from communities where people sort of in charge there or sometimes even elders within those communities um, denied the existence or the history of two-spirited people. And so for so many of those youth, what I heard as sort of feedback was I didn't know there was so many people across the country that were like me. And like the, the greatest value that I took away from this session was I got to build community, right? And I got to meet elders that know that we've always been here that have these teachings, right? And that was like the, the greatest thing. And so, yeah, like, you know, we, we published on the guided dialogues in an anonymized way, but the real value of it for me was the fact that everybody got to come together and get to know each other and like start relationships. And those are relationships that are still ongoing today, right? So that's the legacy of it. You know, I, I, I hope that, you know, coming away from this, you know, we use our voices which sometimes is the only thing that we have as individuals in these systems of power and the hierarchies of power to just, you know, continuously, you know, in, put into the process, you know, voice the importance for the intent, you know, working towards community building, uh, even talking about uh, what it should feel like, you know, to experience community relations in your 
community engagement process. Um, and I feel like for myself personally, when I focus on the aspirations, which are community building, empowerment, connection, uh, learning from elders, seeing young people have fun, having activities to do, like these are all things that feel like medicine and help open up conversations for the variety of activities that folks need uh, as they're doing their community engagement work so that it's not so transactional, right? Like we go into the communities to give something back, which is that sense of relationship and use that as a bit of a window to take some of the information that you need that can inform your project that yeah. should already be part of supporting that community. Absolutely. Like one of the cool things that sort of developed like as a product of like, I saw also some of the other questions spoke to like, how do you design activities and stuff? And how do you make this like uh, not such a heavy space? And what, what's really been cool is um, in the, in the aftermath of the National Inquiry, because I was so like touched by this beating table. <laughs> We've created like these Zoom beating activities where people come together and they sit with survivors and they they sit with me and we sort of go into sort of a pretty informal session where we bead something and we sort of chat and everybody gets to uh, share, you know, what they're, what's going on with them and stuff. And it's been such a good sort of way to think about how can you design these processes so that they are, um, building and affirming and empowering, or you know, at least affirming, not empowering, yeah. um, in a way that that you know makes it um, a, a thing that people walk away from. Like I never want for trauma informed engagement exercise that I'm involved in for people to walk away feeling worse than when they came. I never want that, right? So like practically ensuring supports, right? And the team here has done a really good job for this event of doing that, but also engaging in activities that sort of engage another part of the brain too is really, really important. Um, one of the ways that, and this is a pretty historic thing about the National Inquiry, one of the ways that people were able to share their truth in the National Inquiry was through art making. So we have this thing called the Legacy Archive, and it's a collection of over 800 different artistic expressions from community members and survivors. And it was one of the ways that people could share their truth, right? Because, you know, in, people could, it, they didn't have to come and testify and tell the story in words. They could share their story through poetry, through song, through painting, through art and so also like this notion of valuing other ways of knowing and sort of thinking about trauma engagement uh, as not about trauma but actually about strength <laughs> and affirmation I think is really sort of foundational and really important. <laughs> I was muted and then not muted. <laughs> Um, one of the connections that I'm seeing both in the chats and also on the Slido is um, working in communities where trauma isn't recognized or talked about from the people who are experiencing it themselves um, and uh, supporting communities and people when the trauma has been long term and has become so subtly accepted as a regular part of the community. And in the comments, um, somebody had recognized that there is a nuance between uh, something arising as a conflict when it's really just a disagreement. And so, you know, what's been on my mind lately as we're, you know, talking about, you know, decolonization you know, of ourselves is how, yes, conflict and silence and uh, breaking down a lot of these walls that we put up ourselves that aren't talked about, how that is a process that needs to be honored, that space needs to be made for, I think, a disagreement or a conflict or that anger. Um, especially because this is the natural part of decolonization, right? You're understanding why things are the way they are. You're understanding that you're not the problem, that the problems are systemic. And so I'm wondering if you have anything to say about 
uh, engagement where uh, it gets heated, there's disagreements, people are uh, acting upon their trauma, but aren't necessarily doing it to intentionally hurt you. It's just part of the process. I think we all find ourselves in engagement sessions where it happens. Yeah, I mean, I think that, like, you know, it, it sort of goes into this notion that was raised before around creating safe spaces and making sure that, you know, in, in planning whatever you're doing, that you've thought about it in terms of, like, what supports might, trying to anticipate supports that might be needed, um, either for participants or if you're facilitating or hosting, you know, for you, because the, the likelihood that people are going to sort of call out privilege or going to call out some of these systemic factors are going to call out sort of the implicit or explicit participation of um, those not affected in the systems that oppress people who are is high. Um, I think about it as sort of an inevitable and a really sort of welcome part of trauma-informed engagement when you're working something out with someone um, you want for there to be um, the ability for people to sort of uh, air air what's going on, you want for it to be a place of honesty, uh, you want for whatever truth comes out, even when it's really hard truth, to inform the solution going forward. So I think, you know, I, I, I've been in places where, you know, people have um, reacted to things that I was saying, and, and in a way that, you know, I felt really bad about because I felt like, you know, it like it wasn't what I meant, but it was, you know, because I didn't understand the context or I didn't understand the experience then I wasn't able to sort of anticipate. So I think that's part of sort of being brave and being courageous. It's, it's part of this notion of holding space and also it's part of creating safe spaces. Um, safety, somebody pointed out in the chat, safety doesn't mean comfortable. I think that in the process of engagement, I think that's spot on, right? Um, you know, uh, you can be safe and still really uncomfortable. <laughs> and sometimes you have to be uncomfortable and particularly for people who are engaging with uh, uh, folks that, that have experiential knowledge or trauma to br bring to the table as part of informing the path forward, you have to sort of get comfortable with being really uncomfortable. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of my earliest facilitator teachings was around uh, embracing chaos and honoring that. And it's been the most helpful concept for me in working with young people and working in community um, and, and just dealing with it um, as a natural process of reacting to a system that was set up to uh, oppress and silence you. Um, and um, if we can all get used to understanding the nature of systemic oppression, systemic discrimination, and how uh, it really is a matter of changing the process, opening up uh, the space for more voices to be heard, and doing so in relation with one another, which will then pr produce more of that consensus, that community consensus and understanding that this is what we are working towards. And I feel like when you are doing community engagement work, if you can build that community consensus and everybody's understanding, yeah, this is what needs to be done. Perhaps you're moving in the right direction. You probably had to go over a lot of things that maybe were contentious and people didn't know how to react to. And, you know, in, 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 in relation to this, um, you know, the, the next question, and this will be the final question before, uh, Corinne, we, we turn it over to you to talk about, you know, some of your final pieces of advice and, and direction for folks doing this work. But the final question, um, I think, is really uh, fitting and timely, given all of the work that you've done uh, on the inquiry, is how do we make room for Indigenous women's expertise while also not uh, utilizing this knowledge and experience as free labor, especially if these are folks who aren't 
in a regular salary position. They're not in a position of power. They're also regaining their voice. Perhaps they've been vocal and just not heard. And people are finally recognizing that, oh, yeah, you were right all along. So how do you put so that right. into yeah. uh, the work that we do? So like, I feel like, so that's the thing, like everybody, you know, when we first started talking about the National Inquiry and everybody said, oh, like, you know, it's based on the TRC's call to action. And like, sure, uh, that was illustrated by the TRC's call to action. But the reality was that like Indigenous women and families and communities had been talking about this issue for decades. Like, beyond decades right and no one had been listening right so I really sort of take that 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 question to heart in terms of um, how do we how do we make space for these voices I think you know if you work in an organization or within a process that's hoping to do engagement that's hoping to work with communities then you need to plan for that like you need to um, create processes that value that I know like when I was approached to work on the national action plan uh, like for for several months I was like working for free until I said like give me a break, right? So like I had to like negotiate for myself essentially to create a space in which I wouldn't be sort of like paid for my free labor, right? Um, and it was really, really hard and it was really, really daunting to do that. But the onus shouldn't have been on me to do that. Like there should have already, that should have been thought of and planned for. And I think like, that's the thing. So if we as like, it's hard when I say we, sometimes I'm talking about myself as an Indigenous person or community, and sometimes I'm talking about we as institutions, because I do work in both worlds. <clears throat> but if, as we, if we, as institutions, want to um, sort of do this kind of work, then we need to um, embrace and hold space for agency and expertise in a way that values it. Right. This is very, yeah, Amanda pointed out this is new for government. They do not have processes for valuing engagement. This is exactly what we're trying to do. Right. Um, at the National Inquiry, we had a national family uh, and survivors or sorry, national adv uh, families advisory circle. Uh, we have one now for the MMIWG National Action Plan, right, where we're not just asking families to come forward and participate, you know, for free and share all this experience and knowledge. We, we have created now, we have a process um, to say, like, we understand um, that you have sort of inherent right, we're holding this space for people, um, that there's agency and expertise that's not available anywhere else. So like long story short, you know, I don't think it's on Indigenous women to have to do this planning and to have to try to advocate for things that they should already have. I really feel like institutions and people that want to engage need to do the work in planning to make sure that they have those things in place and and, and, and sort of that they acknowledge the value of what women are bringing to the table um, and that they work like proactively to address this issue of, um, yeah, like uh, valuing what is most important, which is the experiences of people and the knowledge that people can bring. It seems a little odd to... Um, look out at the number of opportunities available for Indigenous peoples today, where space is finally being made for our expertise and voices and unique lenses, but it's being done in such a, I don't think they know what they're getting themselves into, right? And so, you know, that's we're, okay. We're Someone once told me it's easier to beg for forgiveness than to ask for permission. So, yeah, <laughs> I, I think we're going to have to do probably another session with you, Corinne, on um, <laughs> how to act in these positions where you find yourself needing to just say sorry. Yeah, I, I, I did it. You brought me in. You didn't expect it, and and now now this is happening. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> um. We, we're we coming to the end of mm -hmm. our workshop with you. Um, and um, when, we, when we set up our process design, we talked about how 
um, through all of this discussion and all of the chat that you have some pieces of advice or direction for people doing this work and I feel like so I've been watching the chat and I feel like maybe people that are attending have advice and direction for me so I'm going to share some thoughts but I want to start preface that by saying uh Chimi Gwetch, thank you so much everyone who's been so so you know devotedly participating and sharing links and sharing ideas it's been really incredible um to learn from you as well right so I just want to say thank you very much for that I guess if I had to sort of say some advice, what I'd really do is, is think about collecting some of the real pearls of nuggets that have come out in this conversation and not necessarily from my mouth, which is to say, you know, first, you know, recognize that if you're approaching people to do trauma informed engagement or community engagement that you're not saving them, but they might just be saving you. So change the power differential, right? Um, and and just do you know recognize recognize the value of that. I guess second, I would say, you know, be humble. Learn about what you don't know. Learn about the communities that that you're serving. Uh, do the work. So much of the time, this work to educate is put on uh, Indigenous people, um, and. The thing is, there's so many resources, you know, people have shared some in the chat, there's so much out there to help you think about getting to know the context in which you work um, before you approach people um, to try to sort of um, educate you for things that, that are findable if, if you just sort of looked for them. I think, you know, set up good processes, set up processes that value experiential, experiential, I'm sorry, I really have trouble with that word, uh, experiential knowledge, set up things that are affirming, um, you know, recognize the, the, in, the, the inherent value of that and place it on par with the other things that you value, like experts or professionals that come and talk to you, right? Uh, value that. Um, be courageous. Uh, commit to changing course. Don't be afraid to do that. Um, you know, uh, be bold, uh, understanding that if you do change course, uh, then what you'll come out with on the other side is something that must, that is much more valuable uh, than you might have imagined from the outset. Um, I think a couple last sort of final things, um, you know, trauma informed engagement for me is actually about strength and it's funny, it's not funny, but it's, it's odd to call it trauma informed engagement because when I really thought about what I wanted to talk about today, it was actually about this notion of identifying strength through experience, right? Um, so yeah, I think that's really important to note. Um, and then finally, uh, well, almost finally, <laughs> hold space but don't make space. You know, like recognize that people have a right to be at the table, that they have a right to participate, um, that they have a right uh, to, to do this work uh, alongside. Um, Trauma-informed engagement is about relationships. And so I think finally, you know, as you would in any relationship that you really care about, be patient, build trust right? This is the number one, I think one of, maybe not the number one, maybe I don't want to rank them, but this is a real barrier, I think, for people that want to go in and do this engagement and they, they go in and people don't want to work with them. They say, well, well, I didn't do anything, but it's like, no, but you're carrying a legacy. So take the time and build trust and walk alongside, walk with prioritize what community prioritizes and really do the work, you know, with a good heart. Amanda started us off with a song to start us out in a good way but for me that was about creating an open space and a good heart for this session so I think you know the best thing that I can say and I think lots of people have said it in about a thousand different ways already today is go in with a good heart and create a good space and think about all the things that you value in your relationships in your life and think about what those look like when you're doing community engagement. Jimmy Gretsch, thank you so much. Absolutely, thank you. Uh, we, have a, uh, we have a few final words from our SFU VP of, uh, our Associate VP of External Relations who has been with us as a witness and is gonna close us off with just a few words on just all of the learnings and knowledge that has been shared today. So I'm going to call forward uh, Shobana Jaya 
Madhavan uh, to uh, close us uh, off uh, for this award process. Thank you, Ginger. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, yeah, we can hear you and we can see you. Thank you so much. Uh, what an honor to be a witness at today's event and to hear an incredible human being and uh, scholar and uh, leader in our community, Dr. Kareem. And um, I just want to acknowledge what I've heard this morning. And um, I want to start off by how profoundly I was impacted by your reflection on what it means to be a, a, a being human beings versus a human being. And I never thought about it this way. I also never thought about, you know, where while we all say that we are connected, uh, I realized I haven't spent enough time reflecting on what really connects us all. Uh, there were so many lessons I've learned today, uh, Dr. Kareem. Uh, most importantly, about in trauma-informed practice, how we need to expand the frame and go away from a more Western and deficit-based framework because it has implications for the solutions. And hopefully we're all committed as change agents and change makers to find solutions for society's complex and wicked systemic and intergenerational problems. I also realized that I have also, like many, been focusing on trauma from a very individual perspective and not really paying attention to collective trauma. And so in the work that I do and the work that I impact and influence at the university, uh, how do we go from an individual experience to a collective experience and reflect on what really does trauma and violence tell us about our society, the society that we build, society that we are part of, and society that we need to disentangle and unbuild, if there is such a word, so that we have a better society for all. I really was inspired by your call for action. We need to go down new roads, and it is everyone's role to be a change maker and hold space, not make space. That distinction and the clarification that you provided was an incredible insight for me and from the chat I see for many others. Because when we hold space, we can really uh, give power and take power to have new kinds of encounters, which I think is critical to have a better world. I appreciated Ginger challenging us to think about resistance and needing to acknowledge and address it. And also how do we learn by listening and doing like you have done? And how do we embrace and be uncomfortable with the idea that there are risks associated with challenging how we do things and bringing in new solutions. And when we are paralyzed, how do we address it? Just as we need to address a large number of issues, including the issue of free labor when it comes to dealing with systemic issues that impact uh, indigenous uh, communities. So I am going to go away feeling comfortable with the uncomfortable and trying to uh, take some personal accountability and professional accountability in looking at some of the underlying causes of some of the problems and challenges we have at places such as our own university and being bold to ask some critical questions such as, do I realize that I'm not saving anybody but someone else is actually saving me? Do I have the courage to understand the context that I'm working in before I start to do work, before I start to approach people and before I uh, undo and unlearn that I need to figure out a way to create more circles and be part of circles. Like Dr. Kareen said, in nature, we learn important lessons, including that the circle is the strongest form and shape that there is. So I will share these insights and learnings that I've had today as a witness with our President Joy Johnson, my VP Joanne Curry, the EDI group that I'm part of, and many committees and uh, groups that I have the privilege of working in. I commit to remembering uh, the importance of being part of the circle and doing what I can to uh, dis uh, engage from 
uh, disentangle from and recreate new shapes in the work uh, that I do. I want to thank Kareen uh, for your incredible sharing today. Uh, thank uh, Shauna, Ginger, Elodie, and many others who are involved in making this event a possibility. And most of all, the participants, the hundreds of participants we have today, who through their amazing engagement have made us all learn so many new things. So thank you once again, very honored and take care. Thank you everyone. Uh, we see a lot of people leaving. Uh, Thank you, Corinne. Thank you to our active listeners, to all of our facilitators, uh, and for all of the participants for this incredible discussion today. Take and care. I would like to take a moment uh, to introduce the drumming performance by Wildflower. I, I apologize, I forgot to do that. Oh, are, 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 they, are they here? I, I was in un, in the understanding that. Uh, Elodie, I'm just going to take a cue from, from you. Would you like me to introduce the drumming performance, Hamat? Thank you, Shobana. Unfortunately, our drummer was not able to join us today due to some health issues. So we are just going to listen to some music by Chris Dirksen, a uh, free uh, two-spirit cellist to take us away. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care of everyone. Bye.